I decided to try participating in a local zine fest this year. I was actually inspired to try this after talking with Emily Mayer from Minneapolis, who I met on the show previously. Here's something funny. When I was heading to the event, which was held in the downtown library here, I discovered later that I accidentally opened my camera app when I put my phone in my pocket. So it's funny because you can hear me like checking in and stuff like that while I'm going to the event. I think so. Um, I mean, I think I'm around here somewhere. What's your name slash what would American be? American Band Oh, right on. Cool. Um, I've heard All right, so I'm trying to find more ways to get the word out about what I make and what I do and the zine fest seemed more along the lines of what I've been doing. I'm just trying different avenues to see what hits and what doesn't. So I've been looking at possibly traveling to more of these shows. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. One person who listens to the show reached out to me and told me about how he has been trying something similar. Scott Pyburn, and I'm a cartoonist and illustrator. One of the things that I looked into before signing up for the Zine Fest was the Comic-Con circuit. I looked into doing it, but I wasn't sure if it was the right thing for me. That's around the time that Scott had contacted me. He had listened to the podcast and reached out to me on Instagram. He had just entered a bunch of Comic-Cons and going to different places and one of them just happened to be here in Madison. So where are you from? I'm from Villa Park, Illinois, which is a western suburb of Chicago. How did you get started with drawing in general? Like, when did you go, I like drawing? I've been drawing since I was a kid. I was like a third generation artist. My mom was a painter, my grandmother was a painter. So art supplies, we always had art supplies in the house. Crayons, pencils, paints, whatever. I was sculpting with clay. They used to have these butter stick pieces of clay that used to get at the five and dime or whatever and I would sculpt like the Mach 5 way back in the 70s when there was there was no speed racer merchandise whatsoever. Yeah, I've been sculpting and painting since I was a kid. And what made you decide to go kind of the route that you are with more of the comic book style stuff? I'm a child of 70s and 80s so 1985 Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns hits. Boom, mind blown. And I was reading comics before then. My first Batman comic was a record and comic that Neil Adams did it was for like national publications called Stacked Cards, mm. where the Joker robs the museum of the Casso. It was just, it's a great, a great old school record and comic. Okay. And that was my first comic that my mom got me at like the Piggly Wiggly when we lived in Texas. My father was a Texan and uh, I was hooked ever since. Mm. So growing up drawing Batman, drawing comic book characters, I, you know, I've been doing it forever. Did you ever go to school for it? I did. Back in the early 90s, I went to the American Academy of Art in Chicago. Unfortunately, I was unable to finish my degree going into the first Iraq war under Bush Sr. My wife, uh, unfortunately, she, she lost a job and our debt to income ratio got skewed and I got bounced out of the financial aid because it was like, well, you're not making enough to pay financial aid. And then, so I had to drop out of school. Six months later, Sally Mae's like, hey, we want our money. And I was like, hey, I want my degree. I can't get work. So I tried freelancing for a couple of years. It didn't work out. Freelancing how? Uh, basically, I was doing uh, graphic design and illustration. I had a couple clients. I did, uh, I did some international ads for Doctor Who uh, magazine for a company called Alien Entertainment. Did a lot of work for them. But I just couldn't make that momentum without the degree, without the piece of paper, and without the rest of the skill set that I was lacking, I couldn't turn in that into a whole list of clients. So eventually I walked away from illustration and design and again, Sally Mae wanted their, their pound of flesh. I needed to keep them off my back. So I went to culinary school and I became a chef for about five years, five, six years. I was a, almost a pizza champion. I competed at the International Pizza Expo in Las Vegas. Wait, there's a pizza competition? I mean, I suppose so. There are shows about making cakes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, pizza's huge. So I worked in a couple pizzerias, and that kind of got burnt out, kind of had a, a series of domino falls in that arena. And my last one, I was like, you know what? I'm done with culinary. I took a year off. Literally the last day I had unemployment, guy walks up to me. I'm at a food pantry getting food for our family. We're that, we're that tight. Guy walks up to me and hands me a flyer saying, you ever think about driving a school bus? And I was like... No, it was like, yeah, it's good money and you get a sign-on bonus and you get time off here and there. It's like, okay. 
So my day job, I drive a school bus, yeah. you know, and then I've got five, six hours in the middle of the day, I can work on my art. With the school bus thing, is it like teachers where you get the summers off? Yes. Okay. Technically, yes, although we have a lot of charter positions in the summertime. So we'll do the community centers. They take kids to the movies, they have summer camps, that kind of thing. So we have summer schools, we have charters for companies, businesses, we have summer camps. So there's lots of work in the summertime. So I can go on unemployment, take the summer off, or I can work. Last year I worked, so I decided not to take the summer off. It's so weird. Since I started doing the show, I've heard so many stories from people that I meet, how they went in one direction and then ended up returning to art to give it another try. I don't know. It just makes me feel a little bit better that maybe it's not a silly thing to try myself. We also kind of had a common horrible push that propelled us into this direction. Like when my wife got sick, the things I did each day seemed meaningless, which is why I just had to do something. In 2017, I lost my brother. My brother died. I had heart disease and diabetes. And when he went, I decided, you know what? I need to get back to my art because you've only go around once. My brother didn't get a chance to, to make any of his dreams come true. It's time that I make my dreams come true. And I'm 40 something, so approaching 50 something. Right. So <laughs> this is my first year actually doing shows. This is my second show. I'm on the Mighty Con tour, except uh, the only show I'm not doing is New Orleans because it's way too far and, I, and I'm not making enough money to recoup that expense. So, Which is too bad because I've been to New Orleans and it's really cool. I really want to go to New Orleans. I'm a huge food guy and it's like, oh, for the beignets alone and, and, and the Cubans, oh, I would love to go to New Orleans. But I just don't think financially I'll be able to swing it this year. We used to do King County Toy Show a lot. I used to sell a lot of toys because as you can see, I, you know, I collect. I collect, I sell, I collect, I sell. Oh, I'm going to keep this for a while, and nah, I'm going to turn it over. I just finally started thinking that way. I have a huge collection of toys, and I finally started looking at them going, you know, if I sold these, I could buy other ones. And I like having them, and then after a while, it's like, well, they're sitting in storage. Even I'm not enjoying them anymore. Right, right. If, you're, if they're not on your shelf where you can see them and enjoy them every day, and they're just, you know, under the staircase in the box, it's like, yeah, it's time to flip them. But it's really hard to think that way. Yeah, I have a friend of mine, I call him a toysaholic. He buys everything. He'd call me up and he'd be like, Scott, you been to Walmart, you been to the toy aisle? You know, Marvel Series 8 came out. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I got rid of that addiction a while ago. My wife has trained me well. We've weeded down to only the things you are going to keep. We looked at two of the boxes that we have, just two, and they weren't even big boxes. Yeah. And at first glance, it's like 600 bucks worth of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Being at a comic convention, I knew Scott would understand my ideas about my toy collection and selling it, which right now is just the start of an idea that I'm having. An idea to try to continue doing things that I love and sustain myself as a way of doing that. I've talked in the past about having things going on in the background at all times and not being dependent on just one thing. I knew that there was something to this as we discussed it. I just wasn't fully figuring it out yet. One of the things Scott was doing for extra cash on the comic circuit was custom figures that he made of popular characters. And when I saw them, I thought that they were just toys that he brought to put on the table. I do some customs too. You can see here, I, I custom Alfred E. Newman as, as Wolverine. I, I did that. I didn't know that. Yeah, these are, all three of these are customs. This is a custom Captain Kirk, custom Indiana Jones, and and all of the all of the pieces on the Indiana Jones are pieces from the three and three quarter inch set when the Crystal Skull came out, and they had the little little uh, treasures in the boxes. Uh -huh. The base is from um, a Disney exclusive. The body's from the Disney exclusive, and then the legs I cast and the head I cast, and the the hat is from the the hat's removable. That's yeah. not usual. Yeah, no, it's from the twelve inch Hasbro one that came out a while back. <laughs> so you actually yeah. repurposed it. But I repurposed it, and I repurposed all the little trinkets and treasures that came with the three and three quarter inch. So this builds upon when you were saying that you like molded clay, and I mean these are detailed. Yeah. So so how do you go about making these? I did not know that you did these. I was just like, oh look, he's got an Alfred E. Newman oh, collection. No, no, no. These are all customs. Way back in the day, that got me into comics was there was a little little comic book shop called BJ's Country Corner in Villa Park when I was a kid, and I would go into there, and it was like a junk shop. And it was like a maze. He had one rack of comics, and then he had like boxes and boxes and boxes of books. And I loved Mad Magazine. Mm -hmm. And so I would dig through the Mag Magazines. You could get them for a quarter. When they came out, DC came out with an Alfred E. Newman figure, 
I was like, I could have fun with this. So I casted the head and I casted the legs and then I started making these customs. And how long have you been doing that? And you had talked about how you took off from art, but were you still creating stuff like this during yeah, that time? I was still creating a lot of things. Like I did a whole bunch of custom 12 inch figures, like GI Joe figures with costumes and, and everything else. A friend of mine started sculpting heads. He did the entire cast of MASH. We had the Jeep when the 21st century toys came out with like the one six scale Jeep and stuff. And so I, I did a lot of these things. And then I started doing just these Alfred E. Newmans. Are you like pouring these? Like I'm just sitting here going like you I started with to, just like sculpting. I used to do resin. Yeah, I used to pour resin. I used to mold the heads and pour resin and everything else. Right now I've got, I'm looking for, uh, I've got four Tyrion Lannister, Lannister figures from the Game of Thrones. I need two more and then I'm going to do the cast of Time Bandits. <laughs> Really? Okay, there have yeah. never been original ones. No, no, they've never made Time Bandits in an actual figure. The closest thing is there's a company in England that did like Dungeons and Dragons style miniatures sculpted in lead, but no, I've never seen a Time Bandits figure. I love the fact that you're like making your own. You're like, oh, I'd like to see this. And are these movable? Um, some of them are a little poseable. Like Kirk's legs, I actually had to make him shorter. So I actually cut the calves off. So he actually is shorter <laughs> than the actual Captain Kirk. You cut Kirk's calves off. I cut off. Kirk's calves off for, for, for the Alfred E. Newman. And the head doesn't move too much because it was just on a, on a swivel. But the chair is, is the talking chair with all the, with all the sound the effects. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and the Wolverine, his arms move. You can pick him up. I was just going to put the mic over to the Wolverine for some reason. It's he like, that's not going to talk. He's glued, he's glued to the base, but the arms move. I did the same thing. I had to cut the calves down to make him shorter. And then somebody online did this Alfred E. Newman, like the Obama Hope poster as Hopeless. So I printed a mini one out and I pasted it to the, to the garbage can. <laughs> I mentioned I had tried to get into this comic circuit, but it seemed that it was just too competitive for me to even get in, and I wasn't sure if it would pay off in the end. At least that's how it seemed to me. So talking to Scott, I wanted to know more what it was like to do one of these. What were his experiences, especially since he's touring with this Comic-Con? So what made you decide to start doing the comic circuit? Um, I've always wanted to be a comic book artist, um, basically, but I... I didn't get the education, the discipline to draw a perspective, et cetera, et cetera. My style's all over the place. I'm dealing with pen and ink and painting, and, and I'm just having a lot of fun. And a friend of mine, I used to go to this um, non-sports card show in Chicago, and I got a table from him and was selling stuff, and he's like, do you draw and do you sketch? I'm like, yeah, I do some sketching. He's like, maybe at some point, maybe you'd like to be the featured artist for our show. I was like, okay, so I started doing these sketch cards. And at one time he's like, Scott, you know, my guest artist canceled on me. Are you interested? I'm like, yeah. And then I pounded out like 60 sketch cards. I've actually got some professional cards out there. Aliens 40th anniversary set by Tops. They commissioned me to do 50 sketch cards. So they only proved 25 of them. So there's only 25 floating around there, supposedly. But that's like my first professional gig. They reached out to you through this connection or what? Well, I was on, I, I'm on Facebook and so I, I like get on these groups like sketch card artists and it's one of those, okay, this person, this company's looking for artists, submit some samples. I submitted some samples. They came back, hey, we'd like to, we'd like to hire you to do this. And the sketch card market, they don't pay anything. It's literally like you're, you're getting your name out there. Mm -hmm. You're not making any money off of this. It's, it's literally just for, here's my name on, our, on an actual card. But it was a pretty decent experience. I had fun doing it. And it helps level up your art skill because you're studying references and I'm drawing these characters and it's like, all right, this is difficult. How do I do this? How do I make this likeness a little bit better? Yeah. And then unfortunately, the ones that were like spot on, they don't get approved <laughs> at all. Of you know, it's like, oh no, because you know, I had this one, it was great. It was um, Bishop and he's got his thumb up and he's squeezing and the blood is coming out. And then you could just see the, like, the shadow of Ripley's eye behind him, like looking over the shoulder. And because it looked too much like, the eye and the hair looked too much like Sigourney Weaver and they didn't get Sigourney Weaver's likeness, it was like, no, it was kiboshed. I mean, that makes sense talking to each other in the Facebook groups. So they just kind of do like, hey, there's a call for artists sort of thing and those. Sometimes they'll, they'll put up, okay, I'm working on this. And then so, you reach out, and there's one, one group that's got contacts. So at the Comic-Con, we were doing this interview at Scott's table, and someone had come up to ask him a question about his stuff. And that's when I learned about something that I was unfamiliar with. The person had asked about blanks. I had no idea what that meant. And it turns out they were talking about blank sketch covers. What are the blanks, anyway? 
Um, so the, the blank comic book covers basically, comic book companies started doing blanks. And it was like, so you can get your own sketch drawn on them. And so I started collecting them like mad. I haven't done really very many of them at all. So what they are is they are real comic books that you just have a blank cover on top of the regular comic book. In fact, if you open the book, you can see that it also has the actual cover of the comic book as well. Okay. The one, and then I started working on another one, the Infinity Gauntlet Rick and Morty, which is also on the cover of my sketchbook. And if you flip it over and look at the back, that's the old Daffy Duck Looney Tunes. Like, he puts the gauntlet on, and, and it's like, up, oh, everything goes to pot. The blank cover is just stapled on top of the regular comic book. So it's just the logo, the number of the issue on the cover, that's stapled on is white, and people just draw their own version of the comic book cover that they want. I, th I thought this was fascinating. Like, who thought of that? I guess I never knew about the the blanks before. That's interesting. It's kind of like when you'd go to just some touristy town or something, it would be like, have your picture on Time Magazine sort of thing. Exactly. You know, comic book companies a while ago started putting them out, and they become increasingly more and more popular, especially you take them to conventions, you get an artist to draw an original sketch on it, and you've got an original cover. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a, like a number one issue, then you've got a number one issue or a Daredevil 600 or a Captain America number one with an original piece of art on it. And I used to do some of these cons and sell toys, like some of the other vendors, you know, you can see they sell Star Wars action figures or whatever. There's a guy over there that was selling some and it's his last day and he's quitting and he was very he was very crotchety, and it was super enjoyable, actually. It was kind of funny. <laughs> he's like, yeah, take it. Hey, what do you want? Yeah, he did. We were buying some, and we were like, that was not in good condition. And he's like, just take it. It'll be part of it. This is my last day. I don't care. Yeah, yeah exactly. They get that way sometimes. It's like, it's the end of the end of the show. It's like, I don't want to take it home. Yep. Everything's 90% uh, off. <laughs> enjoyable. But so you used to do that. I used to do that. I used to do that. I used to do that a lot. But then I decided, you know what? I want to do my own art. I want to get my stuff out there. Like yourself, so I've got some stories coming down the road, some personal stuff. I'm trying to get back to my own personal daily comic of like, all right, this is what I'm going through, kind of kind of what you're you're doing, you know. It's like, this is what happened today. Oh, I'm pre-diabetic, so what do you mean, I can't eat pizza anymore? What? <laughs> and that might be the title of one of my books. So what, I can't eat pizza anymore? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know? I was gonna ask, like, are there stories that you're gonna tell? Are there stories yes. you're gonna do? I'm definitely working on that. Right now, I am in the fan art phase which is, it's basically just selling fan art. Probably easier to sell. Yeah, it gets, it attracts people yeah. to the booth. I mean, that's part of the reason I brought the Mad, Mag Mad figures because they draw people in, oh, this is really cool, and then they stop, and then they, they look. Mm -hmm. I want to get to that point where, hey, like, right. this is me, this is the story I'm doing, and this is all I'm selling, but I ain't, I'm not there yet. I'm still, I'm still dealing with perspective and oh god I gotta draw a figure from behind and three-quarter view and mm -hmm. and just training myself to get back into that mode when I was in art school I could do that that was 10 10 12 years ago mm -hmm. I gotta get back to that point I would say one of the things that I had to try and the hurdle I had to get over was not worrying about that like exactly what you're talking about like just drawing and like going you know figure it out live the one advantage I have is like I've never really claimed that I'm like a realistic artist so it's okay for me to like go yeah, this is the way it's going to look. It's, it's cartoony. I love how you've made your wife look like Betty Rubble. It, it, you know, very simple. She actually really hates it. Scott made an interesting point about drawing people in with his fan art toys. So the next couple of shows that I did, I started bringing items from my vast toy collection that I had mentioned before with me and putting them on the table just to catch people's eye. Little did I know that this would spark the idea for something else that I'm going to do. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the future. Are you making connections at these things? I'm trying to make connections. That's one of the things I'm still learning. Like, I'll post everything on Instagram. Yeah. I'm trying to get my Instagram followers to jump up a little bit. I think, like you said, it's a matter of posting something every day. Yeah. And I'm trying to manage my, my time and my life. I haven't been able to post new art every day. Mm -hmm. Getting to that point and then also transitioning from just posting fan art to telling a story mm -hmm. and yeah. getting people interested in my story. I mean, you clearly have the talent, but I think you're right. Like, you have a story to tell, even if it's just something personal or something short or just, like, a short run of something, testing it out, something for people to connect to. I mean, yeah, yeah, and it was like when I met you, you know, and, and I sent you sent you a nice email, and you put me in your comic. I was like, that's awesome, <laughs> you know? And I was like, hey. well, That's why I wanted to do it. I mean, that's exactly it. I looked around and realized I had no friends that did the same thing, so I'm like, well, pff, there are people out in the world. Let's meet them and talk about them. And what have you, what would you say you've learned from doing these? Like, I mean, clearly it's been a learning experience, so what have you gotten from it? What I've gotten from it is don't chase trends. 
there's a lot of people out there chasing trends. And for a few years when I was thinking about doing this, I would walk through conventions and take pictures of other people's tables. It's like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Let's do this. Um, let's do mashup prints. Let's do this. Uh, you got to be true to yourself because, you know, I did 60 or so trading cards for a show just to do characters. And I had some fun doing them. But then you get to the point you're just grinding it out. If you're not doing stuff for yourself to have fun, to please yourself, you're not going to please anybody else. Uh, I started doing some comic strips, like old school um, newspaper style, but then I realized the format, it's not Instagram friendly. So now I'm formatting, and I've got, um, that I just was playing around with Photoshop, I'm printing out basically different, different designs that are Instagram friendly for doing a comic strip. And so my idea is just to play around with, okay, I can do four panels, I can do six panels, I can do five panels, and just, this is the format, write a story, start sketching. And, and I've even got this in Photoshop, because eventually I'm going to go digital. Yeah. I just haven't gone digital yet. It's like I have a Wacom, but it scares me. Yeah. I look at it, and I'm like, I, don't, I can do this in pen and ink and pencil, but I don't know how the pixels work. <laughs> the other thing I'm looking, looking into doing is I want to do a children's book. So, and I've got a story. It's just a matter of, of figuring it out. But I listen to Will Terry's podcast and the, those guys, and they're heavy into, yeah, do a children's book because if, if, if it hits, residuals could be great. You know, that could be passive income down the road. Again, it's trying not to put the money cart before the art cart, but you got to think at some point, okay, how can I profit off of this, you know? Did you ever do a job doing characters of people or stuff? Just out of curiosity. No, I, I've done a few shows where it's like, okay, do some caricatures. Mm. I did one in college. It was a, it was a nightmare. It was yeah. just just like, oh. I would never want to do it. That's why I asked. It was a wedding. It was like, oh, let's hire a couple character artists to do a wedding. And everybody was drunk and nobody's sitting still. So you're literally just like, yeah. Picasso, here you go. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, Oh, it was like, it was miserable. <laughs> so, yeah. and I thought about doing characters like, oh, you could work at Great America over the summer. Mm. I applied, never heard back. You said you were thinking of starting an Etsy shop and stuff like that. So are you just, is it just the time that you uh, would need to put into it that's kind of why you haven't started it yet? Or? Yeah, it's a lot of time. Like, I got to scan all the artwork and then it's like, okay, it's fan art. I was originally selling these for $10 a piece. Nobody's buying them at 10 bucks. So I lowered the price of sketch cards to five bucks. Mm. It's like, all right, mm. what is someone willing to pay for your artwork. And if your artwork's not good enough, even at five bucks, why am I gonna put in a lot of effort into building an Etsy shop when I'm still kind of in skill development? You know, I'm leveling my skills up slowly but surely, yeah. working on portraits, et cetera, et cetera. Once I find my true medium, my true style, then at some that point I might say, okay, now I'm invested. This I'm confident, I'm more confident. Now I'm invested, now I'll put an Etsy shop together. Mm -hmm. And have you ever thought about actually doing them as print-on-demand stuff, too, so you wouldn't have to scan them? Like, you just kind of create something that when people ordered it, I mean, it's a lower cut of the profit, but it would just be like, it would be no cost to you. Like, it would be, you could promote it and people would buy it. The company that makes them would be the one that prints it out, like shirts and prints and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever thought of that? Yeah, I, I after printing 60 sketchbooks on my Canon <laughs> printer at home, and like, because I, I was a printer. I was an offset printer back in the 90s. Oh, you were? Oh yeah, I worked uh, to uh, T-Head Hamada Press, and we had to do registration. It was mostly envelopes and stuff, two color, four color envelopes and stationery. It was a pain in the butt. But yeah, after doing that on my home printer yeah. and printing 60 copies and, and collating them and stapling them, I'm like, yeah, that's the last print run I'm ever going to do myself. You know, and I did 200 buttons. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, I love the, because you print them out and then I gotta, you get a punch and you punch them out and then you put the artwork right. in and you cr press it and crank it and press it and crank it and put yeah. it together. And it's a lot of fun. But then it's like, I haven't sold one the whole show. Right at two dollars to what would a loan lower them to a dollar i don't know right. it's kind of like what happens with stickers it's like they either you give them away for free or nobody's gonna buy them since talking to scott he posted online that he actually did get one of those caricature jobs caricature jobs there we go that's the best i'm gonna do with that one he applied for it and he plans to start doing that over the summer you can check out more of Scott's work at his website, scottpyburn.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, head over to my website at americanbandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list and find all the links to the other stuff that I'm doing online. Or if you have any questions or would like to contact me, you can do that there as well. 
Just go to AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. So thanks for listening, and until the next episode, so long. Mm-hmm.